question for Darcy first. So AA programs historically do not believe in or support medication-assisted treatment. Given the poor success rate without medication, is there an effort to change this approach in AA, especially since court often orders AA attendance? Um, AA, 12-step uh, groups, uh, NA, they have a place. They have a place, uh, and depending on the substance that you use, they have a different place, right? Um, when we talk about opioids, we need to talk about best practice for opioids. And we need to look at using medication-assisted treatment and cognitive behavioral therapy. We need to look at that for at least the first year. Now they may, someone may decide that AA and NA are an important part of their recovery process and they want to be a part of that. Um, the next question about AA and NA I think it has to do with their, um, the philosophy that doesn't support oftentimes the use of medication-assisted treatment or other substances and that alienates people who need that for their recovery. So I think that we do have to have this conversation in depthly. We do have to uh, find a way to work together in order for both to be available for someone to be on their recovery path. Um, I've had uh, the most powerful messages sent to me from people who experience what they call primary uh, discrimination for their addiction and secondary discrimination for their recovery because they took the best practice route and they have medication-assisted treatment that is helping them get through. So I uh, agree with the person who's asked the question. It's something that needs further discussion and I hope we can find a way that makes it all work for people to do that. So, Mr. Wheeler, what are what are you doing to connect all the deaths related that that are related to dealers specifically? Is there anything being done to try to combat that? Um, we keep a database of every death that we're together once we get the uh, the medical examiner's report and the toxicology, and we try to investigate each one of those as, as a potential homicide. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Uh, a lot of it. Uh, depends where the person passes and can we get access to their phone. Our, our cell phones, our smartphones, they are our lives. And most of the time they would have communicated with the person that sold them the drugs. We don't have uh, a statute in New York to charge someone with homicide if they cause a death. We charge them with sale of the drug. Uh, this particular, this year so far we've charged uh, I believe four people with uh, sales that have led to people's deaths. We have a few more that will be coming in, in the future. Uh, but again, we keep, we have uh, a list. We look at the type stamps on the drugs, particular type, uh, and uh, we try to do the best we can with them. It's, it's an evolving area of the law. Uh, we have a lot of resistance from the legislature, from uh, anti-law enforcement groups that do not want to allow us to prosecute somebody for homicide when they cause death. Um, again, that's something that has to be fought in Albany. That's not something that we deal with on the, on the ground. But, uh, and the reason for that is that a lot of people have issue with the fact that the person took the drug voluntarily and then charging someone with a homicide. Because in the law, the person actually has to cause the homicide and if there's an intervening fact that you voluntarily take it, that creates a problem. But we try to investigate everyone in Orange County as if it, if, if it was a homicide. Last year, uh, we investigated over 80 where we looked at the circumstances. I believe we did 40 search warrants last year for telephones looking for information on dealers. So we do the best we can with them, but again, a lot of it is being able to get the information up front to be able to track back who sold the drugs. Thank you. Dr. Saladino, I'm going to paraphrase the person who wrote this, but I think I'm going to get an idea of what you're asking. Um, can you talk about uh, people's use of marijuana for self-medication for anxiety, and then talk about the genesis of um, moving marijuana to legalization? Well, marijuana has been certainly in the news. Uh, I think with each passing moment, uh, there are more indications for medical cannabis. Um, I'm sorry, can you ask the question I again? Can. Sure. Yeah, so um, essentially, 
how do you feel about people using marijuana for self-medication for anxiety first? And then what, should, what do you think the philosophy behind legalizing the marijuana is? Yeah. I, I don't feel, I, I think it's important that, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm a medical cannabis uh, proponent. I think that medical cannabis and its uses are underestimated. And it does have a PTSD indication, an anxiety indication. My only qualm with that is that I would, I would recommend that you get it, get connected with a physician who's a prescriber. That way, that individual, that doctor can monitor you. Uh, they can look for certain patterns of behavior. Uh, marijuana is an addicting substance in up to 10% of people. So that means a five, uh, you know, what, what I discussed with the substance use disorder, may exhibit all those signs. So overall, it's not an addicting dr drug per se. Um, I think as more time passes, there will be more exploration of this, and there will be more indications for medical cannabis. But there's a lot of pushback from pharmaceutical companies, uh, from people that have preconceived prejudices about marijuana. But I think in the near future, there's going to be certainly more indications of anxiety being one of them. Another one for Dr. Salamino. What is the criteria for medication uh, well, somebody that walks in our office, they say they have a problem. Uh, we take it very seriously. Uh, certain, there's no contraindications to medical assisted treatment. Obviously, if you have an allergy to the medication, that's a contraindication. Uh, but, but there's really uh, uh, no exclusion. If somebody has heavy comorbidities, a lot of psychiatric illness, poly substances. So it's not just opioids, but it's cocaine, methamphetamine. Uh, they may require a higher level of care than coming to a doctor's office ultimately once a month for a prescription. Uh, we try to coordinate care with uh, the behavioral science groups in our area. You know, uh, uh, again, because this is a multifaceted approach. Uh, but overall, we try not to turn anyone away from medically assisted treatment. The impact has been incredible. The limiting factor is that doctors can only prescribe it to 275 patients. Okay, you're limited as to the number of patients you can treat, and I think that's a great limiting step for us. And certainly something politically that many are working towards in terms of trying to remove X licensure waiver. Simply put, prescribers can write the drugs that cause the problem, but are limited in writing the drugs that can fix the problem. And if we don't fix that, and we don't fix that soon, that's, that's a problem. Now, the folks will tell you that the reason that is is because they don't want anyone just simply writing um, for these, these types of medication without education. So um, there, is, there is education that uh, providers have to take. So a primary care provider, whoever wants to do it, has to take eight hours worth of education, apply to the DEA for a specific licensure to do it, um, and nurse practitioners have to uh, apply and do 24 hours of education and then apply to the DEA uh, for the same thing. So, uh, and as Dr. Saladino indicated, then you're capped out at 275 patients. What we, con what we constantly say is, would you tell a physician who's trying to treat diabetes that they could only have 275 patients? And the answer to that question is no. So there has to be some uh, there has to be some more work on that as, as we move forward. Who is coming up in that room? All right. Yeah. Who, uh, that's a, it's a designated number by uh, the DEA, and, and, and they get to decide that. Mm -hmm. So do you agree? We agree. So the clinic has one doctor. Mm -hmm. Are they only allowed to prescribe to 275, or does the clinic have more? Are they allowed it's to? It's per physician, so it's mm -hmm. per provider. So it's mm -hmm. 275. Sometimes one doctor covers two clinics. Right. So that's 275 is split between. It becomes very limited as, as time goes on. And because of all of the, there, and, and you know, honestly, we could probably do a two hour seminar on this one piece of it. Um, because there's a lot of rate limiting steps within it, um, because it's not just that you can only have 275, it's the programs that you have to put in place to ensure that the person is not abusing and how you do that. All of that becomes very onerous for a primary care physician to do. So kudos to Dr. Saladino and those that are doing it, um, because it, it is it is pretty taxing on a practice when you have to when you have to go through those rigors.
Well, we have in, in this county a Welcome Orange Geriatric Initiative that is really uh, focusing. We've received some money from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration and technical support from the state. Multi partners, uh, we have uh, Catholic Charities, Mental Health Association, Jewish Family Services, Adult Protective Services, Department of Mental Health, really acknowledging that our aging population may be more likely to be prescribed opioids for pain um, and have a challenge with addiction and or have unmet mental health needs that may have started much earlier or may have to do with the isolation and loneliness that comes with aging and their uh, role in the community or perceived role in the community. So we are really trying to target education and support and bringing services to their homes where they're at, going to senior centers, having um, supports available because we acknowledge that the needs of our aging population are unique to them in some ways, similar certainly in others, um, but also that they are at risk for having pain as they get older and having these prescription drugs in their homes. Whether they're using them, and if not, then the, the risk of the medicine cabinet, right, and the younger people in their lives, then that's a, we want them to be educated about that as well. Uh, so Dr. Saladino, let me give this one to you, and I think it comes back to probably a really important topic in terms of um, how, how medication-assisted treatment, how is it different uh, than use of the original substance? Well, the one thing, getting back to what I was discussing, there's no tolerance that builds up with medically assisted treatment. So if you need one or two Suboxone strips a day to get the normalcy back in your life, whatever that normalcy is, you won't come back six months later and say, I need to take, I need more Suboxone. Uh, so that's one. There's less, there's the tolerance factor. Uh, there is a withdrawal that does happen when you abruptly stop Suboxone because in essence you're tricking your brain into thinking you're still using opiates. It's simplistically what uh, buprenorphine is. Okay? It fits into the receptor. So to, on a brain level, on a molecular level, uh, you're still using opiates to that extent. But again, there's no tolerability that develops. Uh, there's no maladaptive behavior that develops with medically assisted treatment. Uh, you won't, you know, resort to crime. You won't resort to, to, uh, to uh, sort of back alleyways to try to get Suboxone. But there is a black market for Suboxone. Okay? There, is, there, there is an abuse potential for Suboxone. Uh, but you won't find somebody saying, I want to get high with Suboxone. It's just that that's the case. It's purely psychological. It's not physiological, it plateaus. Um, so in that essence, you know, uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is these patients are coming to see me once a month. So they're having an interaction with a physician, they're getting their questions answered, they're asked how they're doing, uh, you want to encourage them to tell you if they've had any relapses. Um, and that sometimes is a tricky part because I think somebody mentioned you know, when it comes to how much alcohol you drink, what drugs you use, and what, what, what your sexual sexuality is, people will always tell you what you want to hear, okay? So that is basically uh, uh, the medically assisted treatment.